Chapter six, Recreating America, Independence and a New Nation, 1775 to 1783. This chapter is gonna take us from the beginning of the revolution through the Treaty of Paris of 1783 that formerly ends the American Revolution and recognizes American independence. Individual choices, Esther DeBert Reed. Esther DeBert was born in London but came to Philadelphia in 1770 as the bride of a young lawyer, Joseph Reed. She began her life as a colonial wife and mother in the midst of the crisis that would lead to the American Revolution. By 1778, her husband was the governor of the state of Pennsylvania, and though Esther had no formal political voice, she was determined to make her own contribution to the revolution. Working with Ben Franklin's daughter, Sarah Bach, Esther DeBert Reed organized the first major fund drive in American history. Together, these two daughters of liberty mobilized some of the most prominent Philadelphia women to go door to door, collecting money for Washington's army. Over 1,500 people contributed $300,000 in paper money and almost $7,500 in gold and silver. Reed shared her fundraising plan with Patriot women in Maryland, New Jersey, and Virginia, and they too collected money for the troops. Realizing that the fundraising campaign was a radical act for, quote, proper women, Reed issued a bold statement entitled Sentiments of an American Woman that defended women's active participation in the Patriot cause. Later in this chapter's individual voice feature, you'll be able to read part of her argument for women's entrance into the public sphere. Reed did not live to see the full success of her plan. She died in September, 1780 at the age of 34. That's three years before the peace treaty is formally signed. She had shocked some Philadelphians by her actions, but many agreed with a French government representative who declared Esther de Burt Reed, quote, the most zealous and active patriot the revolution had inspired. No matter what 18th century Americans felt about the war, no matter which side they supported or what role they played, they shared the experience of extraordinary events and the need to make extraordinary choices when the war disrupted their lives. In this most personal and immediate sense, the war was as revolutionary for them as it was for the farm boys who would become, for a brief but critical moment, soldiers in the name of liberty. Great Britain expected an easy victory over the colonial rebels and, on paper at least, the odds against an American victory were staggering. Great Britain could commit vast human and material resources to crush the rebellion. The well-trained and harshly disciplined British troops, British ground troops, were assisted and supplied by the most powerful navy in the world, and they carried the flag of Europe's richest imperial power. Many Indian tribes, including most of the Iroquois, allied with the British, and the Crown could expect thousands of white and black loyalists to fight beside them as well. The American resources were far less impressive. The Continental Congress had a nearly empty treasury and the country had none of the foundries or factories needed to produce arms, ammunition, or other military supplies. Through most of the war, therefore, American officers and enlisted men could expect to be underpaid or not paid at all. They were likely to go into battle, battle poorly equipped, often half starved, and frequently dressed in rags. Unlike the British Redcoats, these Americans had little military skill or formal military training. Britain's advantage was not absolute, however. The British had to transport arms, provisions, and men across thousands of miles of ocean. They risked delays, disasters, and destruction of supplies on the open seas. The Americans, on the other hand, were fighting on familiar ground, and geography gave them an additional advantage. Their vast rural society could not be easily conquered, even if major colonial cities were taken or if an entire region was occupied. Long-standing European rivalries also gave the Americans potentially valuable allies, since Holland, France, and Spain all stood to gain from England's distress. In 1778, when France and Spain decided to formally recognize American independence, the war suddenly expanded into a global struggle that stretched British resources thin. The first two years of war, considering the questions, what were the British and the American strategies in the early years of the war? and what decisions and constraints kept the British from achieving the quick victory many expected. In 1775, General Thomas Gage, the military governor of Massachusetts and commander of the British Army of Occupation there, surely wished he were anywhere but Boston. The town was unsophisticated by British standards, many of its inhabitants were unfriendly, and its taverns and lodging houses bulged at the seams with complaining loyalist refugees from the countryside. Gage's army was restless and his officers were bored. The American encampments outside the city were growing daily, filling with thousands of local farmers and artisans. These colonial militiamen were clearly the military enemy, yet in 1775, they were still citizens of the British empire, not foreign invaders or foes. Gage, 
like his American opponents, was caught up in the dilemma of an undeclared war. The battle for Boston. The Americans knew that artillery could do serious damage to Gage's army in Boston, but they had no cannon. To obtain them, New Haven druggist Benedict Arnold joined Vermont farmer Ethan Allen, and in May of 1775, their troops captured Fort Ticonderoga in New York and began transporting the fort's cannons across hundreds of miles of mountains and forests to Boston. By the time the artillery reached the city, however, a bloody battle between Gage and the American militia had already taken place. In early June, Gage had issued a proclamation declaring all armed colonists traitors, but offering amnesty, um, meaning a general pardon granted by a government, especially for political offenses. Um, they've granted or offered, excuse me, this amnesty to any rebel who surrendered to British authorities. When the militiamen ignored the general's offer, Gage decided that a show of force was necessary. On June 17, 1775, Gage's fellow officer, William Howe, led a force of 2,400 soldiers against the rebels, a rebel-held Breed's Hill. Despite the day's oppressive heat and humidity, General Howe ordered his men to advance in full dress uniform, weighted down with wool jackets and heavy knapsacks. Howe insisted on making a proper frontal attack on the Americans. From the top of the hill, Captain William Prescott's militiamen immediately opened fire on the unprotected redcoats. The result was a near massacre. The tables turned, however, when the Americans ran out of ammunition. Most of Prescott's men fled in confusion, and the British soldiers bayoneted the few who remained to defend their position. Even battle-worn veterans were shocked at the carnage. The British suffered more casualties that June afternoon than they would in any other battle of the war. The Americans, who retreated to the safety of Cambridge, learned a costly lesson. An effective supply line of arms and ammunition was vital for victory. Little was gained by either side. That the battle was mis misnamed the Battle of Bunker Hill captured perfectly the confusion and the absurdity of the encounter. Congress creates an army. In Philadelphia, the Continental Congress was busy taking its first steps toward recruiting and supplying an army. The regular army that took shape was actually a collection of small state armies whose recruits preserved their local or regional identities. This army was expected to follow the war wherever it led, while state militias were expected to join in any battles that took place within their own borders. Congress chose French and Indian War veteran George Washington to command the Continental Forces. Washington wrote gloomily in the, of the task before him. Nothing he saw when he reached Massachusetts on July 3rd, 1775 made him more optimistic. A carnival atmosphere uh, seemed to prevail inside the militiamen's unsanitary camps. Farm boys turned soldiers fired their muskets at random, often using their weapons to start fires or to shoot at geese flying overhead. In the confusion, they sometimes accidentally wounded or killed themselves and others. Quote, seldom a day passes, but some persons are shot by their friends, Washington noted in amazement. He was disturbed, but not surprised by what he saw. He knew that the men in these camps were country boys, away from home for the first time in their lives. The chaos they created resulted from a combination of fear, excitement, boredom, inexperience, and plain homesickness. Despite his sympathy for these young men, Washington acted quickly to recognize the militia units, replace incompetent officers, and tighten discipline within the camps. The British, meanwhile, laid plans to evacuate Boston, spurred in part by the knowledge that Arnold's wagon train of cannons was nearing Massachusetts. In March 1776, a fleet carried Thomas Gage, his officers, the British Army, and almost a thousand Loyalist refugees north to the safety of Halifax, Nova Scotia. The King now turned the war over to two brothers, General William Howe and Admiral Richard Howe. Their assignment was clear, bring the rebellion to a speedy end. At this point in time, by the way, March 76, that is between the publication of Common Sense in January of 76 and the Declaration of Independence being signed in, of course, July of 76. The British strategy in 1776. General Howe's strategy was to locate areas with high concentrations of loyalists and use these Americans to secure the allegiance of their undecided and rebellious neighbors. Howe targeted two reputed centers of loyalist strength. The first, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, had a legacy of social and economic conflicts that led many of the region's elite families to see independence as a threat to their prosperity. But loyalism was not confined to the conservative and wealthy. Among the poor settlers of the Carolina backcountry 
decades of bitter struggle with coastal planters had led to the regulator movements and to intense loyalist sentiment among the embattled frontier men and women. General Howe's strategy had its flaws, however. First, although many people in these two regions were loyal, their numbers were never as great as the British assumed. Second, everywhere they went, British and hired Hessian troops, who by the way are German soldiers from the state of Hesse, they're hired by Britain to fight in the American Revolution. The British had hired Hessian troops. Um, they left behind a trail of destruction and abuse that alienated potentially loyal men and women. Howe was not likely to win over families who saw wives and daughters raped and cattle killed and lying about the field and pastures, household furniture hacked and broken into pieces, wells filled up and tools destroyed by these Hessian troops. In 1776, Howe launched his first major military assaults in the South and the Mid-Atlantic region. In North Carolina, loyalists did not turn out to fight for the crown, but the British General uh, Henry Clinton failed to provide them with the military support they needed. Excuse me, they did turn out to fight for the crown, but the British General Henry Clinton failed to provide for them and the military support that they needed. Poorly armed and badly outnumbered, Carolina loyalists were decisively defeated by the rebel militia on February 27th in the Battle of Moores Creek. The British then abandoned their loyalist allies in favor of taking revenge on South Carolina. An impressive fleet of 50 ships and 3,000 men sailed into Charleston Harbor. But the Americans had unexpected good luck. Working frantically to defend the harbor, they constructed a flimsy fort out of local palmetto wood. To the surprise of both sides, the cannonballs fired by British ships sank harmlessly into the absorbent, pulpy palmetto stockade. The fort and the city of Charleston remained standing. Embarrassed and frustrated, the British abruptly ended the Southern campaign and General Clinton sailed north. The North and South Carolina loyalists, however, could not escape British failures. They had been denounced, mobbed, imprisoned, and sometimes tortured since 1775. Their situation grew even worse after the British withdrew. Escape from New York. While Clinton was failing in the Carolinas, the Howe brothers were preparing a massive invasion of the Mid-Atlantic region. In July of 1776, the Howes sailed into New York Harbor with the largest expeditionary force of the 18th century. With 30,000 men, one third of them Hessian mercenaries, this British army was larger than the peacetime population of New York City. The Howes did not plan to demolish New York, however. Unlike most British officers, the brothers were genuinely fond of Americans and they preferred to be agents of compromise and negotiation rather than of destruction. They hoped that a spectacular show of force and a thorough humiliation of rebel commander George Washington would be enough to bring the Americans to their senses. General Washington rushed his army south from Massachusetts to defend the city, but he had few illusions that his 23,000 men, many of them sick and most of them unexperienced at war, could repel the invading British force. For a month, the Howes made no move on the city. Finally, on the morning of August 22, 1776, the British began their advance, landing unopposed and moving toward the Brooklyn neck of Long Island. There is a map on page 130 that is fantastic to take a look at. Just as Washington had feared, five days later, when fighting began, almost all of his raw and inexperienced troops surrendered or ran. Washington, at the scene himself, might have been captured had the Howes pressed their advantage, but they withdrew, content that they had made the American commander look foolish. Washington took advantage of the Howes' delay to bring his troops to the safety of Manhattan Island. But on September 15th, a British attack again sent his army into flight. Angry and frustrated, Washington threw his hat to the ground and shouted, are these the men with who I am to defend America? Washington's army fled north with the British in hot pursuit. In a skirmish at Harlem Heights, the American commander was relieved to see his men stand their ground and win their first combat victory. He was even more relieved by the strange failure of the British to press their advantage. When the Redcoats finally engaged the Continentals again at White Plains, the Americans managed to retreat safely. Soon afterward, Washington took his army across the Hudson River to New Jersey and marched them farther west across the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. Winter Quarters and Winter Victories. Before the cold set in, General Howe established winter quarters for his troops in the New York area and in Rhode Island. He expected Washington to make camp somewhere as well, but Washington, safe for the moment in Philadelphia, was too restless to settle in just yet. 
Enlistment terms in his army would soon be up, and without some encouraging military success, he feared that few of his soldiers would reenlist. Thus, Washington looked eagerly for a, good, for a good target to attack, and he found one, a garrison near Trenton, manned by two or 3,000 Hessian troops. On Christmas night, amid a howling blizzard, General Washington led 2,400 of his men back across the river. Marching nine miles, the Americans arrived to find the Hessians asleep. The surprise enemy surrendered immediately. Without losing a single man, Washington had captured 900 prisoners and many badly needed military supplies. Taking full advantage of the moment, Washington made a rousing appeal to his men to reenlist. About half of the soldiers agreed to remain after the Battle of Trenton. The Battle of Trenton was a sweet victory, but Washington enjoyed his next success even more. In early January, he attacked the British garrison at Princeton. On the way, his advance guard ran into two British regiments. As both sides lined up for battle, Washington rode back and forth in front of his men, shouting encouragement and urging them to stand firm. His reckless behavior put him squarely in the line of fire, but it was effective. When the British turned in retreat, Washington rashly rode after them, clearly delighted to be in pursuit for once in the war. The Trenton and Princeton victories raised the morale of the Continental Army as it settled at last into its winter quarters near Morristown, New Jersey. They also stirred popular support for the raids that many called Washington's nine-day wonder. Of course, General Howe was still poised to march on Philadelphia when warm weather returned, and Congress still had few resources to spare for Washington's army. When Washington pleaded for supplies, Congress urged him to commandeer what he needed from civilians nearby, that means to take it. The general wisely refused. English high-handedness and cruelty had turned many people of the area into staunch supporters of the revolution, and Washington had no intention of alienating them or making them mad by stealing their stuff. Burgoyne's New York, New York campaign, ooh, sorry about that. Burgoyne's New York campaign, there we go. In July of 1777, General William Howe sailed up the Chesapeake Bay toward Philadelphia with 15,000 men. The Continental Congress had already fled the city, knowing that Washington could not prevent the enemy occupation, and the British had little difficulty capturing Philadelphia. The problems they did face in 1777 came from the poor judgment of a flamboyant young British general named John Burgoyne. Burgoyne had won approval for an elaborate plan to separate New England from the rest of the American colonies. He would move his army south from Montreal, while a second army of redcoats and Iroquois, commanded by Colonial Barry St. Ledger, would veer east across the Mohawk Valley from Fort Oswego. At the same time, William Howe would send a third force north from New York City. These three armies would rendezvous at Albany, effectively isolating New England and, it was assumed, giving the British a perfect opportunity to crush the rebellion. On paper, this daring plan seemed to have every chance of success. In reality, however, it had serious flaws. First, neither Burgoyne nor the British officials in England had any knowledge of the American terrain that they had to cover. Second, they badly misjudged the Indian support St. Ledger would receive. Third, General Howe, no longer in New York City, knew absolutely nothing of his own critical role in the plan. Blissfully unaware of these problems, Burgoyne and his army began their march southward from Montreal in June of 1777. The troops floated down Lake Champlain in canoes and flat bottom boats, and they easily retook Fort Ticonderoga. But from this point on, things began to go badly for Burgoyne. In true 18th century British style, Burgoyne chose to travel well rather than lightly. The 30 wagons moving slowly behind the general contained over 50 pieces of artillery for the campaign. They also contained Burgoyne's mistress, her personal wardrobe and his, and a generous supply of champagne. When this caravan encountered New York's swamps and gullies, movement slowed to a snail's pace. Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys added to Burgoyne's problems by harassing his troops as they entered Vermont. A bloody head-on battle near Bennington further slowed Burgoyne's progress. Then, when the general's army finally reached Albany in mid-September, neither St. Ledger nor Howe was in sight. The degree of Iroquois support St. Ledger had, encountered, had counted on failed to materialize, and he met fierce resistance in the Mohawk Valley. When news reached him that Benedict Arnold and an army of a thousand Americans were approaching, 
St. Ledger simply turned around and took his exhausted men to the safety of Fort Niagara. Howe, of course, had no idea that he was expected in Albany. This left John Burgoyne stranded in the heart of New York with dangerously low supplies and a hungry and tired army. On September 19th, Burgoyne attacked the American lines, hoping to clear a path of retreat toward Canada. The American general, Horatio Granny Gates, was neither bold nor particularly clever, but it took little daring or genius to defeat Burgoyne's weary soldiers. And so on October 17, 1777, General John Burgoyne surrendered to the Americans. On both sides of the Atlantic, news that a major British army had been defeated was a powerful boost to American confidence and an equally powerful blow to British self-esteem. The rebel victory also reversed the fortunes of American diplomatic efforts. Until the Battle of Saratoga, American appeals to Spain, France, and Holland for supplies, loans, and military support had met only moderate success. Now, after the Battle of Saratoga, hopes ran high that Britain's rivals would recognize independence and join the war effort. Winter quarters in 1777. John Adams, who never wore a uniform, had once toasted a, quote, short and violent war. After Burgoyne's defeat, many Americans believed that Adams' wish was coming true. General Washington, however, did not share that optimism. French help might be coming, he pointed out, but who knew when? In the meantime, he reminded Congress, his army still needed funds and supplies. Congress ignored all of his urgent requests. The result was the long and dreadful winter at Valley Forge, 20 miles away from Philadelphia, where General Howe and his army were comfortably housed for the winter. Throughout December of 1777, Washington's men labored to build the huts and cabins they needed, not only for themselves, but also for the hundreds of women and children who flocked to the safety of the camp. The presence of enlisted men's families, fleeing starvation or physical abuse by enemy soldiers, transformed the army camp into a crowded temporary city. Washington could not turn these families away, so he quickly set the women to work cooking, laundering, and nursing sick soldiers. Rations were a problem from the start. Most soldiers and civilians at Valley Forge lived primarily on a diet of fire cakes made of flour and water baked on a fire. Blankets were scarce, coats were rare, and firewood was precious. An army doctor summed up conditions when he wrote, quote, poor food, hard lodgings, cold weather, fatigue, nasty clothes, nasty cookery, vomit half my time, smoked out of my senses, the devil's in it, I can't endure it. The doctor, however, did endure it. So did the soldiers he tended to daily, men such as the barefoot, half-naked, dirty young man who cried out in despair, I am sick, my feet lame, my legs are sore, my body covered with this tormenting itch. While civilians and comfortable homes mastered the steps of the latest dance craze, the soldiers at Valley Forge traded the remains of their uniforms and sometimes their muskets for the momentary warmth and sense of well-being provided by liquor. The enlisted men who survived the winter at Valley Forge were strangers to luxury even in peacetime. Most were from the humblest social classes, farm laborers, servants, apprentices, and even former slaves. But if poverty had driven them into the army, a commitment to see the war through kept them there. The contrast between their own patriotism and the apparent indifference of much of the civilian population made many of these soldiers bitter. Private Joseph Plum Martin expressed the feelings of most when he said, a kind and holy providence had done more to help the army at Valley Forge than the country in whose service we were wearing away our lives. These suffering soldiers did get one thing they desperately needed though, professional military training. In the spring of 1778, an unlikely Prussian volunteer arrived at Valley Forge. Baron Frederick von Steuben was almost 50 years old, dignified, elegantly dressed, with a dazzling gold and diamond medal always displayed on his chest. Like most foreign volunteers, many of whom plagued Washington more than they helped him, the Baron claimed to be an aristocrat, to have vast military experience, and to have held high rank in a European army. In truth, he had purchased his title only a short time before fleeing his homeland in bankruptcy, and he'd only been a captain in the Prussian army. He had not, however, exaggerated his talent as a military drill master. All spring, the Baron could be seen drilling Washington troops, alternately shouting in rage and applauding with delight. Washington considered von Steuben a most unexpected and invaluable surprise. 
There's also speculation that he was gay and that's a reason why he had to leave Prussia behind and seek a new uh, path forward here. In the spring of 1778, Washington received the heartening news that France had formally recognized the independent of the United States. He immediately declared a day of thanks and issued brandy to each enlisted men at Valley Forge. American diplomacy had triumphed. Diplomacy abroad and profiteering at home. Considering the questions, what strategy did Benjamin Franklin pursue to win recognition from the French? And how did the French alliance affect the war effort and wartime spending? Like most wars, the American Revolution was not confined to the battlefields. Diplomacy was essential and American diplomats hoped to secure supplies, safe harbors for American ships, and if at all possible, formal recognition of independence and open military assistance. General Burgoyne's defeat made the widening of the war into an international struggle a real possibility. The long road to formal recognition. In 1776, England had many enemies and rivals in Europe who were only too happy to see George III expend his resources and military personnel to quell a colonial rebellion. Although these nations expected the American Revolution to fail, they were eager to keep the conflict going as long as possible. Before Saratoga, they preferred to keep their support for the revolution unofficial, but after Saratoga, the Americans had reason to hope for more. In December of 1776, Congress had sent the printer, politician, scientist Benjamin Franklin to France to pursue formal recognition of American independence. The charming and witty Franklin was the toast of Paris, adored by aristocrats and common people alike, but even he could not persuade the king to support the revolution openly. Burgoyne's surrender changed everything. The British government had begun scrambling to end a war that had turned embarrassing, and the French government began scrambling to reassess its diplomatic position. If the American Congress agreed to a compromise ending the rebellion, France could gain nothing more. But if the French helped keep the war alive, perhaps they could recoup or take back some of the territory and the prestige that they'd lost to England in the Seven Years' War. Remember that France lost Canada after that and some other territory. This meant, of course, recognizing the United States and entering a war with Britain. French Foreign Minister Charles Gravier, Comte de Vergen, knew a choice had to be made, but he was not yet certain what to do. Meanwhile, the English government was indeed preparing a new peace offer for Congress. The King, King George III, was willing to make large concessions. He would agree never to tax the colonies again and to repeal any objectionable legislation such as the intolerable acts that had been passed since 1763. The Americans, however, were unimpressed by this offer. For Congress, a return to colonial status was now unthinkable. Benjamin Franklin knew that Congress would reject the King's offer, but he was too shrewd to relive, to relieve the Comte de Vergennes' fear that a compromise was in the works. Franklin warned that France must act quickly and decisively or accept the consequences. His gamble worked and in 1778, France and the United States signed a treaty linking French and American fates tightly together. Under its provisions, neither country could make a separate peace with Great Britain. By 1779, Spain had also formally acknowledged the United States. And in 1780, the Netherlands did so too. King George III had little choice but to declare war against these European nations also. The revolution had thus grown into an international struggle that taxed British resources further and made it impossible for Britain to concentrate all its military might and naval power in America. Diverting ships to the Caribbean and to Europe, the European coast undermined Britain's blockade of American ports and its ability to transport troops. Above all, if the Americans could count on the cooperation of the French fleet, a British army could be trapped on American soil cut off by French ships from supplies, reinforcements, and any chance of escape. To skip back now to a deeper understanding of history, what's that mean? The impact of a political cartoon or a political poster usually depends on its use of familiar, easily recognizable symbols. Unless the viewer is familiar with these symbols, the cartoon often makes little sense and has little power to persuade. Imagine, for example, that you did not know the figure of Uncle Sam personified America. So if you saw a cartoon featuring a tall, slim man dressed in red, white, and blue, who is pointing his finger at the viewer and declaring, Uncle Sam needs you, what might you think? Whose uncle is this? I don't have an uncle named Sam. What does this man need me for? American political cartoons have had a number of stock repeating symbols. For example, Uncle Sam, a screaming eagle, a donkey and an elephant, 
a woman dressed in a long flowing white robe, holding a lamp or a sword, or perhaps a scale, a pair of shackles, or a snake cut into several pieces. You will probably recognize these as a form of shorthand for the US government, for the two major political parties, for liberty, for slavery, and for the need for unity. Some symbols are more universal, of course, and they are not tied to American history. For example, a dove means peace and a hawk means war in the symbolism of many countries. There is an economy in every good political cartoon. That is, nothing in it is extraneous or extra. Everything in it symbolizes or evokes something. Each element in the drawing is part of a story or a message that the cartoonists wants to convey. If there is a caption to the cartoon, it too is there as a clue to the cartoonist's message. Consider the cartoon that you see there on page 135. It was drawn in 1778 when Britain sent a peace commission to America. There are six characters, five white men and an American Indian. The men are wealthy for they are dressed in wigs and brocaded coats. Their posture, heads bowed and hands clasped as if in prayer, suggests that the words above their heads are pleas made to the Indian sitting elevated above them. The Indian, on the other hand, is almost nude, her only clothing a cloth draped over her lower torso and thighs, much like the women in Roman and Greek statues. Over her head, a halo shines, and in her right hand, she holds a spear. To interpret the cartoon, a viewer must understand who or what these figures and their attire represent. An 18th century viewer would have no trouble deciphering the message. The clothing of the commissioners represents the decadence and love of luxury that American patriots believed led to the corruption into which the British government had sunk. The Indian, on the other hand, needs no silk or satin to convey her natural majesty. The halo surrounding her head symbolizes purity and nobility, but the spear in her hand symbolizes a readiness to defend the realm she rules. She is a common symbol of America, vigilant in the protection of her people's liberty. Her authority and power rest upon the natural bounty of America, wheat, rice, tobacco, and other crops desired by the English and Europeans. Her head is turned away from the commissioners. She will not give in to their pleas or promises. Once the symbols are deciphered, the message is clear. America will not surrender. It will not compromise with a corrupt Great Britain. As you read through this textbook, look for other cartoons. Decipher their messages by decoding their symbols. Only then will the picture be worth a thousand words. War and the American public. News of the alliance with France unleashed an orgy of spending in America, especially among those who had profited from the sale of supplies to the army. The treaty with France meant that European goods could flow across the ocean once again, and Americans with money welcomed the chance to purchase them. Many of the goods imported into America over the next few years were actually British made. A black market in English goods grew rapidly for American consumers apparently saw no contradiction between patriotism and the purchase of enemy products. Optimism, cheap money, and plentiful foreign goods thus combined to create a wartime spending bonanza. The government and the military also succumbed to this spirit of self-indulgence. Corruption and graft, or misuse of position for profit or advantage, were common as both high and low ranking op officials sold government supplies for their own profit or charged the army excessive rates for goods and services. Cheating the government and the army was a game civilians could play too. Wagoners carting pickled meat to military encampments drained the brine from the barrels to lighten their load so they could carry more. The results were spoiled meat, soldiers suffering from food poisoning, and a greater profit for the cartmen. Soldiers became accustomed to, de to defective weapons, defective shoes, and defective ammunition, but many of them joined the profit game by selling off their army-issued supplies to any available buyer. Recruiters pocketed the bounties given to them to attract enlistees. Officers accepted bribes from enlisted men seeking discharges. Congress seemed to be the only group unable to join in this spending spree. Bluntly put, by 1778, the government was broke. When Congress tried to deal with its financial crisis by printing more paper money, the result was rampant inflation. The value of the continental, as the congressional paper money was called, dropped steadily with each passing day. The government's inability to pay soldiers became widely known and enlistments plummeted. Both the state militias and the Continental Army resorted to impressment or forced military service to fill their ranks. Men forced to serve, however, were men more likely to mutiny or to desert 
officers did not know whether to sympathize with their unpaid and involuntary soldiers or to enforce stricter discipline upon them. Congress acknowledged the justice of the soldiers' complaints by giving them pay raises in the form of certificates that they could redeem after the war. From stalemate to victory, considering the questions, what factors produced a stalemate in the war? What characterized warfare in the South and what led to General Cornwallis's surrender at Yorktown? And what were the most important results of the peace treaty negotiations? The French presence in the war did not immediately affect its course. The war in the North fell into a stalemate because English generals had grown overly cautious and Washington could not mount a major campaign without the support of the French fleet. In late 1778, the act of war shifted to the South once again as the British mounted a second major campaign in the Carolinas. The war stalls in the North. Sir Henry Clinton, now the commander of the British Army in North America, knew that the French fleet could easily blockade the Delaware River, cutting off supplies to occupied Philadelphia. So, as spring arrived in 1778, the British forces made their way east through New Jersey and route to New York. Clinton's slow-moving caravan, with its long train of bulky supply wagons, made an irresistible target and Washington decided to strike. Washington entrusted a former British career officer, General Charles Lee, with the initial attack. Lee marched his men to Monmouth, New Jersey, and as the British approached, the Americans opened fire. Yet as soon as the British army began to return fire, Lee ordered his men to retreat. When Washington arrived on the scene, the pursuing British troops were closing in. Washington rallied the retreating Americans, calling on them to reform their lines and to stand their ground. Trained by von Steuben, the men moved forward with precision and speed to drive the Redcoats back. The Battle of, Mon Battle of Monmouth was not a decisive victory, but Washington had saved it from be becoming a defeat. He saw to it that Lee, who had long been a critic and rival, was discharged from the army. If Monmouth was a disappointment, the first American and French joint effort was a disaster. In August, a combined land and naval force targeted the British base at Newport, Rhode Island. But at the last minute, French Admiral d'Estaing decided that casualty rate would be too high. He abruptly gathered up his own men and sailed to safety on the open seas, leaving Washington's American troops behind to retreat as best as they could. Throughout the fall and winter of 1778, Washington waited glumly for effective French naval support for a major campaign. The news coming from the Western Front did little to improve his bleak mood. In Kentucky and in Western Virginia, note that West Virginia is not a state yet, deadly Indian attacks had decimated many American settlements. The driving force behind these attacks was a British official named Harry Hamilton, nicknamed Hair Buyer because of the bounties he paid for American scalps. In October, Hamilton led Indian troops from the Great Lakes tribes into the Illinois Indiana region and captured the fort at Vincennes. The American counterattack was organized by a stocky young frontiersman, George Rogers Clark, whose own enthusiasm for scalping earned him the nickname Long Knife. To Washington's relief, Clark and his volunteer forces managed to drive the British out of Vincennes. Border conflict with Britain's Indian allies remained a major problem, and when Loyalist troops joined these Indians, the danger increased. So did the atrocities. When Patriot General John Sullivan's regular army was badly defeated by local Loyalists and the followers of Mohawk chief Thayendanegea, Sullivan took revenge by burning 40 Indian villages. It was an act of violence and cruelty that deeply shocked and shamed General Washington. Spring and summer of 1779 passed and still Washington waited for the French Navy's cooperation. Fall brought the general the worst possible news. Admiral d'Estaing and his fleet had sailed for the West Indies under orders to protect valuable French possessions in the Caribbean and, if possible, to seize English possessions there. News of Destang's departure spurred a new wave of discipline problems among Washington's idle troops. Mutinies and desertions increased. From his winter headquarters in Morristown Heights, New Jersey, Washington wrote to von Steuben, the prospect, my dear Baron, is gloomy and the storm thickens. The real storm, however, was raging not in New Jersey, but in the Carolinas. To skip back and read the feature on page 137 in the wider world, Britain and India. While the British government fought to keep its rebellious North American colonies, this was not its only focus. 
In fact, since the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the British have been engaged in a rivalry with the Dutch, Portuguese, and French for control of trade and commerce in Asia. The East India Trading Company had been created for this reason. By 1639, England had taken Madras, an island off the coast of India, and victory against the French in the French and Indian War had allowed England to drive the French out of the competition for the Indian trade. Although the rival Dutch trading company remained profitable and powerful in the East Indies, by 1757, Britain had established informal rule in key regions of India, and British rule in India would continue for a very long time after that point. The Second Carolinas Campaign. Since the fall of 1778, the British had been siphoning off New York-based troops for a new invasion of the South. The campaign began in earnest with the capture of Savannah, Georgia. Then in the winter of 1779, General Henry Clinton sailed for Charleston, South Carolina, eager to avenge his embarrassing retreat in the 1776 campaign. And there is a wonderful map there on page 138. 5,000 Continental soldiers hurried to join the South Carolina militia in defense of the city. From the Citadel, a fortification spanning the northern neck of the city's peninsula, these American forces bombarded the British with all they could find, firing projectiles made of glass, broken shovels, hatchets, and pickaxes. From aboard their ships, the British answered with a steady stream of mortar shells. On May 12, 1780, after months of deadly bombardment and high casualties on both sides, the Citadel fell. The American commander, General Benjamin Lincoln, surrendered his entire army to the British, and a satisfied General Clinton returned to New York. Clinton left the Southern campaign in the hands of Charles Cornwallis, an ambitious and able general who set out with more than 8,000 British regulars, joined by Loyalist troops as eager to defeat their enemies as Clinton had been. Since the British had abandoned the South in 1776, Small roving bands of loyalist guerrilla fighters had kept resistance to the revolution alive in a bloody civil war of ambush, arson, and brutality between the Carolinas' Tidewater Patriots and backcountry loyalists. By the summer of 1780, the fortunes in this war within a war had reversed. The revolutionaries were now the resistance, using guerrilla tactics against the loyalists who were in control. The revolutionary resistance produced legendary guerrilla leaders. Francis Marion, known as the Swamp Fox, organized raiding bands of white and black recruits who steadily harassed Cornwallis's army and effectively cut British lines of communication between Charleston and the interior. Other guerrilla leaders, including Thomas Sumter, focused their energies on the loyalists. When these patriots and loyalists met head on in battle, they honored few of the rules of war. In October of 1780, for example, in the Battle of Kings Mountain, Revolutionaries surrounded Loyalist troops and picked them off one by one. As this bitter civil war continued, marauding bands often made up of outlaws posing as soldiers, terrorized civilians and plundered their farms. The regular American army under the command of the Saratoga hero Granny Gates had little success against Cornwallis. In August of 1780, Gates suffered a crushing defeat at Camden, South Carolina. That fall, Washington wisely replaced Gates with a younger, more energetic officer from Rhode Island, Nathaniel Green. When he arrived in South Carolina, Green found that the 1,400 Continental soldiers who remained there were tired, hungry, and clothed in rags. Their officers had been unable to prevent them from plundering local communities. To ease the strains caused by civil war and atrocities, Green offered pardons to loyalists and proposed alliances with local Indian tribes. In the end, he managed to win all but the Creeks away from the British. Green's military strategy was attrition, wear the British out by making them chase his small army across the South. He sent Virginian Daniel Morgan and 600 riflemen to Western South Carolina to tempt troops there under the command of Benastre Tarleton into pursuit. Tarleton finally caught up with Morgan on an open meadow called the Cowpens in January of 1781. When the outnumbered Americans stood their ground at Cowpens, ready to fight, the tired and frustrated British soldiers panicked and fled. Annoyed by this turn of events, Cornwallis decided to take the offensive. Now it was Green's turn to lead the British on a long, exhausting chase. In March of 1781, the two armies finally met at Guilford Courthouse, North Carolina. 
Although the Americans lost the battle and withdrew, British losses at Guilford Courthouse were so great that a disgusted Cornwallis ordered his army northward to Virginia. Treason and Triumph. In the fall of 1780, one of Washington's favorite officers, Benedict Arnold, defected to the British. Although the Americans foiled Arnold's plot to turn over the fort at West Point, New York to the British, his treason sat in Washington and damaged American morale. News the following spring raised Washington's spirits, however. The French help was at last on its way. When Washington met with the French General Rochambeau in May of 1781, Rochambeau insisted on a move against Cornwallis in Virginia and had already ordered Admiral de Grasse and his fleet to the Chesapeake. Having little choice, Washington agreed to this plan. On July 6, 1781, Washington's continental forces and a French army began a long march from north of Manhattan all the way to Virginia. The French soldiers, elegant in their sparkling uniforms, were openly amazed and impressed by their bedraggled allies. It is incredible, wrote one French officer, that soldiers composed of whites and blacks, almost naked, unpaid, and rather poorly fed, can march so well and stand fire so steadfastly. Within a few months, General Cornwallis too would be forced to admire the American Army's stamina. Unaware that an enemy army and navy were headed his way, Cornwallis decided to move his own forces to the peninsula port of Yorktown. It was a choice he would heartily regret. General Cornwallis of the British has just made a very fatal error. error. Um, pay attention to Yorktown. By September of 1781, Washington's army had reached Virginia and Admiral de Grasse's fleet was in place in Chesapeake Bay. General Clinton, still in New York, had been devastatingly slow to realize what the enemy intended. With most of the British fleet in the Caribbean, the desperate Clinton had only a single naval squadron to dispatch to Cornwallis's rescue. Admiral de Grasse had no trouble fending off Clinton's West rescue squadron. Then he turned his naval guns on the Redcoats at Yorktown. From his siege position on land, Washington also directed a steady barrage of artillery fire against the British, producing a deafening roar both day and night. On October 19, 1781, Lord Cornwallis admitted the hopelessness of his situation and he surrendered. It is said that at the surrender ceremony, a British army band played a tune called The World Turned Upside Down. Yorktown is the site of the last major battle of the revolution. American and French troops trapped Cornwallis's army on this peninsula near the Chesapeake Bay and they forced him to surrender. But despite the American victory at Yorktown, fighting did continue in some areas. Loyalists and patriots kept on fighting in the South for another year and bloody warfare against the Indians continued along the frontier. The British still occupied Charleston, Savannah, and New York, but the British had given up all hope of military victory against their former colonies. On March 4th, 1782, Parliament voted to cease and desist the further prosecution of offensive war on the continent of North America for the purpose of reducing the colonies to obedience by force. The war for independence had been won. Winning diplomatic independence. What Washington and his French and Spanish allies had won, the American diplomats Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay had to preserve. At first glance, these men made an odd trio. Franklin was witty and sophisticated. Adams was competitive and self-absorbed and socially inept. And Jay was aristocratic and reserved. Yet they proved to be a highly effective combination. Franklin brought a crafty skill and a love of strategy to the team, as well as useful knowledge of French pol politics. Adams provided the backbone for in the face of any odds, he was a stubborn and determined watchdog of American interests. Jay was calm, deliberate, and a match for Adams in patriotism and integrity. Franklin, Adams, and Jay understood what was at stake at the peace table. They knew that their chief ally, France, had its own agenda and that England still uh, won wavered on the degree of independence America had actually won at Yorktown. Thus, the American diplomats issued a direct challenge to Britain you must formally recognize American independence as a precondition to any negotiations at all, meaning that Britain has to say that America is independent before they even sit down at the table. The British commissioner reluctantly agreed, 
Negotiations continued for more than a year with all sides debating, arguing, and compromising until the terms of a treaty were finally set. In the Treaty of Paris of 1783, the Americans emerged with two clear victories. First, the boundaries of the new nation were extensive. Second, the treaty granted the United States unlimited access to the fisheries off of Newfoundland, a particular concern of New Englander John Adams. It was difficult to measure the degree of success on other issues, however, since the terms for carrying out the agreement were so vague. For example, although Britain ceded or gave the Northwest to the United States, the treaty offered no provisions for Indian approval of the transfer of this land, and there was no timetable for British evacuation of its Western forts. In some instances, the treaty's vague language worked to America's advantage. For example, it included only a general promise that the American government would help British merchants collect the extensive pre-war debts owed by Southern planters and an equally general pledge that the government would urge states to return confiscated property to loyalists. The peacemakers were aware of the treaty's shortcomings and its lack of clarity on key issues, but this was the price for avoiding stalemate and dangerous confrontation on controversial issues. Franklin, Adams, and Jay knew the consequences might be serious, but for the moment, they preferred to celebrate rather than worry. Basically, they have no choice but to accept this treaty that is vague in some parts because extending negotiations could be a little bit dangerous and not necessarily work in Americans' favor. Republican expectations in a new nation. Considering the questions, how did the revolution affect Americans' expectations regarding individual rights, social equality, and the role of women in American society? What opportunities were open to African Americans during and after the revolution? And what was the fate of the loyalists? As an old man, John Adams insisted that the revolution was more than battlefield victories and defeats. The revolution took place, he said, in the hearts and the minds of the people. What he meant was that changes in American social values and political ideas were as critical as artillery, swords, and battlefield strategies in creating this new nation. The people were, of course, far more diverse than Adams was ever willing to admit, and they often differed in their hearts and minds. Race, region, social class, gender, religion, even the national origin of immigrants, all played a part in creating, a diver excuse me, in creating diverse interests and diverse interpretations of the revolution. Adams was correct, however, that significant changes took place in American thought and behavior during the war and the years immediately after. The protection of fundamental rights. The Declaration of Independence expressed the commonly held American view that government must protect the fundamental rights of life, liberty, property, and as Jefferson put it, quote, the pursuit of happiness. The belief that Britain was destroying these rights was a major justification for the revolution. Thus, Americans were certain to demand the protection of these fundamental rights from their new governments. The protection of many individual rights, freedom of speech, assembly, the press, the right to a trial by jury, were written into the new constitutions of several states. But some rights were more difficult to define than others. While many Americans supported freedom of conscience, for example, not all of them supported separation of church and state. Virginia approved George Mason's Declaration of Rights, which guaranteed its citizens the free exercise of religion, but the state continued to tax monies used to support the Anglican Church. It was not until 1786 that the Statute of Religious Freedom ended tax-supported churches in Virginia and guaranteed complete freedom of conscience even for atheists. Other Southern states followed Virginia's lead. The battle was more heated in New England, where some wished to continue government support of the Congregational Church, while others simply wished to keep the principle of an established church alive. The compromise was to require every town to make one church its established church, but to let the communities decide which denomination that would be. New England did not separate church and state entirely until the 19th century. Protection of property rights. In the decade before the revolution, much of the protest against British policy had focused on the right to private property and the government's duty to protect that right. For free, white, property-holding men, and for their sons and those white male servants, tenant farmers, or apprentices who hoped to join their ranks someday, life, liberty, and happiness were tightly connected to the right of land ownership. The property rights of some infringed on the freedoms of others, however, 
white American claims to Western land denied the rights of Indians to that same land. A master enjoyed a claim to the time and labor of his servants or apprentices. In the white community, a man's property rights usually included the restriction of his wife's right to own or sell land, slaves, and even her own personal possessions. And the institution of slavery transformed human beings into the private property of others. Even for white men, the right to property was sometimes an unattainable ideal, meaning sometimes they can't even get it. When the revolution began, one fifth of free American people lived in poverty or demanded on the community's charity. For some, Taking advantage of opportunities to acquire property was difficult even when they arose. Washington's continental soldiers, for example, were promised Western lands as delayed payment for their military service. But when they left the army in 1783, most were penniless, jobless, and sometimes homeless. They had little choice but to sell their land warrant certificates, trading their future as property owners tomorrow for bread and shelter today. Although economic inequality actually grew in the decades after the revolution, a Republican commitment to social equality led to reforms that reshaped political realities in some states. Pennsylvania and Georgia eliminated all property qualifications for voting among free white males. Other states lowered their property requirements for voters, but refused to go as far as universal white manhood suffrage. They feared that the outcome of such a sweeping reform was unpredictable. Even women might demand a political voice, imagine that. As a note, by the election of Andrew Jackson in 1828, most free white men are able to vote regardless of whether they own property or not. Toward a more perfect union separating church and state. The founders of our nation knew their history. They had witnessed or read about the destructive religious wars that had plagued Europe for centuries as Catholics battled Protestants, Puritans rebelled against Anglicans, and monarchs executed, banished, or harassed men and women who they labeled as heretics to the established church. Even within their own new country, Religious battles had led to bloodshed in the conflict between Catholics and Protestants in Maryland and the hanging of Quakers in Massachusetts. Although many states were reluctant to give up the tradition of an official or an established religion supported by taxes on all their citizens, the framers of the constitution carefully avoided linking any religion or denomination to their national government. There would be no established church in the United States. And with the Bill of Rights, freedom of religion became a founding principle of the nation. Individuals might practice any faith they wished, but they could not impose their beliefs on others. That was the idea, at least. Women in the New Republic. The war did not erase differences of class, race, religion, or age among women, but many wartime experiences were universally shared between women of many different backgrounds. Rich or poor, white or black, most women would remember the war years as a time of constant danger, anxiety, harassment, and unfamiliar and difficult responsibilities. As their men went off to war, these women took on the task of managing shops and farms in addition to caring for large families and coping with shortages of food and supplies. Some, like the woman who pleaded with her soldier husband to pray come home, may have feared they would fail in these new circumstances. Yet many spoke with satisfaction about their new roles. They expressed their sense of accomplishment in, letting, in letters to husbands that no longer spoke of your farm and your crop, but now spoke of our farm, farm and even my crop. Some women found they enjoyed the sudden independence from men and from the domestic hierarchy that men ruled in peacetime. Even women in difficult circumstances experienced this new sense of freedom. Grace Galloway, wife of loyalist exile Joseph Galloway of Pennsylvania, remained in America during the war in an effort to preserve her husband's property. Shunned by her patriot neighbors, reduced from wealth to painful poverty, Grace Galloway nevertheless confided to her diary that Ye liberty of doing as I please makes even poverty more agreeable than any time I ever spent since I married. If Galloway experienced new self-confidence and liberty during wartime, not all women were so fortunate. For the victims of rape and physical attack by soldiers on both sides, the war meant more traditional experiences of vulnerability. For women, just as for men, the war meant adapting traditional behavior and skills to new circumstances. Women who joined husbands or fathers in army camps took up the familiar domestic chores of cooking, cleaning, laundering, and providing nursing care on a larger scale than in their own household. Throughout the war, loyalist and patriot women used traditional assumptions about women's non-political nature to their advantage. They slipped unnoticed through enemy lines as spies and couriers, 
they turned their homes into havens for soldiers. And in their cellars, they stored weapons along with food preserved for the winter. They basically take advantage of misconceptions about women um, as being unpolitical and use it to their advantage. Many such conscious acts of patriotism did not fit within traditional wifely duties. When women burned their crops or destroyed their homes to prevent the enemy from using them, they were acting as daughters of liberty. And in the battle zones, women crossed gender boundaries dramatically. Although few disguised themselves as men to enlist as soldiers, many became accidental combatants. Molly pitchers like Mary Ludwig, who carried water to cool down the cannons in a fort under siege, would take the place of fallen soldiers. They would load and fire the weapons. After the war, female veterans like Margaret Corbin, who was wounded while firing cannon against the British army, applied to the government for pensions, citing as evidence the wounds they had received in battle. In the post-war years, members of America's political and social elite engaged in a public discussion of women's roles in the new Republican society. The Enlightenment had dispelled earlier notions that women were incapable of rational thought, and women's many contributions to the war effort proved their capacity for patriotic commitment and political loyalty. Thus, opinion makers urged a new role for women within the family, the moral upbringing of their children. The Republic, they said, must rely on wives and mothers to inculcate patriotism and Republican principles in both their sons and their daughters. This new ideal, Republican mother or womanhood, is very important for APUSH. It's also sometimes called Republican um, motherhood, but Republican womanhood had practical roots as well as intellectual ones. Even before the revolution, the growth of a prosperous urban class able to purchase many household necessities freed these urban wives and mothers from domestic production. Because they no longer needed to, no longer needed to make cloth or candles or butter, they had time to devote to raising children. Republican womanhood probably had little immediate impact on the lives of ordinary free women who remained unable to purchase essential goods or to pay others to do household chores or in the lives of African-American or Indian women. Although women's active role in the education of the next generation was often applauded as a public political contribution, it did not lead to formal political participation for female Americans. Republican womanhood or Republican motherhood will have limits. The Constitution left suffrage or voting qualifications to the state governments, and only one state, New Jersey, failed to stipulate male as a condition for suffrage in its first constitution, but this oversight was soon revised. Communities were also given a critical role in educating future citizens. Arguing that a citizen could not be both ignorant and free, several states allotted tax money for public elementary schools. Some even went further. By 1789, for example, Massachusetts required every town to provide free education to its children. After the revolution, children meant girls as well as boys. This new emphasis on female education was a radical departure for women. Before the revolution, the education of daughters was haphazard at best. Colleges and the preparatory schools that trained young men for college were closed to female students. A woman got what formal knowledge she could by reading her father's or her brother's books. Most women had to be content to learn domestic skills. After the revolution, however, educational reformers reasoned that mothers must well be versed in history and even political theory if they were gonna teach their children the essential principles of citizenship. By the 1780s, private academies had opened in every state to educate the daughters of wealthy American families. These privileged young women enjoyed the rare opportunity to study mathematics, history, geography, and political theory. Although their curriculum was often as rigorous as that in a boys' preparatory school, the addition of courses in fancy needlework reminded the girls that their futures lay in marriage and motherhood, not government or the professions. The war's impact on slaves and slavery. Liberty and freedom were major themes of the revolution. But the denial of liberty was a central reality in the lives of most African Americans. To win their freedom, thousands of slaves had opposed the Patriot cause and risked their lives to escape to the British Army. In contrast, only about 5,000 African American men joined the Continental Army once Congress opened enlistment to them in 1776. Black soldiers were generally treated better by the British, but in both armies they received lower pay than white soldiers, and they were also often assigned to the most dangerous or menial duties. 
slaves found other routes to freedom besides military service during the war. Some escaped from farms and plantations to the cities where they passed as free people. Others fled to the frontier where they joined sympathetic Indian tribes. Women and children in particular took advantage of wartime disruptions to flee their master's control. With American victory in 1781, thousands of former slaves boarded British transport ships headed to what they hoped would be a better life in Canada, England, British Florida, or the Caribbean. But their dreams often went unrealized. 3,000 former slaves settled initially in Nova Scotia, but the racism of their white loyalist neighbors led more than a thousand of these veterans to emigrate a second time. Led by an African-born former slave named Thomas Peters, they sailed to Sierra Leone in West Africa, where they established a free black colony. During the war, loyalists had taunted patriots asking, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the drivers of Negroes, meaning slaves? The question made the contradiction between revolutionary ideals and the American reality painfully clear, especially to patriots in the Northern states where slavery was not widespread or integral or important to the economy. In the 1760s and 1770s, influential political leaders such as James Otis, Thomas Paine, and Benjamin Rush campaigned to end slavery. In Boston, Phyllis Wheatley, a young African-born slave whose master recognized and encouraged her literary talents, called on the revolutionaries to acknowledge the universality of the wish for freedom. In every human breast, Wheatley wrote, God had implanted a principle which we call love of freedom. It is, as imp it is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. To go back to It Matters Today on page 145, tracking changes in gender roles. 18th century women like Mary Ludwig Hayes and Esther de Burt Reed tested the limits of traditional gender roles, demonstrating bravery on the battlefield and political organizing skills during the American Revolution. But it would be over 140 years before their descendants could vote in a national election and decades more before they could serve in the military. The impact of the social change can be seen today in the accomplishments of women such as Lieutenant General Claudia J. Kennedy, the US Army's first female three-star general, Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman to become a Supreme Court Justice, Madeleine Albright, the first woman Secretary of State, and Shirley Chisholm, the first woman to run for the presidency of the United States from a major political party. And in 2016, Hillary Clinton became the first woman to win the nomination of a major political party. Tracking major changes in gender roles and examining why those changes occurred is a critical part of the historian's task. If you want, you can consider the question, do you think a woman president is likely to be elected in your lifetime? Explain the factors on which you base your opinion. Going back to the text. Free Black Americans joined with white reformers to mount anti-slavery campaigns in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. In Boston and Philadelphia, slaves petitioned on their own behalf to be liberated from a state of bondage and made free men of this community. In the North, it proved easier to acknowledge the truth in the slaves cry, we have no property, we have no children, we have no city, we have no country. In 1780, Pennsylvania became the first state to pass an emancipation statute, making manumission or freedom from slavery a public policy rather than a private matter of conscience. Pennsylvania lawmakers, however, compromised on a gradual rather than an immediate end to slavery. Only slaves born after the law was enacted were eligible, and they could not expect to receive their freedom until they had served a 28-year term of indenture, meaning that they can't be free until after they're 28 years old. By 1804, all Northern states except Delaware had committed themselves to a slow end to slavery. Slavery was far more deeply embedded in the South, where it was a labor system and a system that regulated race relations. In the Lower South, slave owners ignored the debate over slavery and took immediate steps to replace missing slaves and to restore tight control over work and life on their plantations. Manumissions did occur in the Upper South. Free Black communities grew up in both Maryland and Virginia after the Revolutionary War, and planters openly debated the morality of slavery in a republic and the practical benefits of slave labor they did not all reach the same conclusions. George Washington freed all his slaves on the death of his wife, but Patrick Henry, who had often stirred passions with his spirited defense of American liberty, justified his decision to continue slavery with blunt honesty. Freeing his slaves, he said, would be inconvenient. Thanks, Patrick Henry. <laughs> 
the fate of the loyalists. After 1775, America's loyalists flocked to the safety of British occupied cities, crowding first into Boston and later into New York City and Philadelphia. When the British left an area, the loyalists evacuated with them. More than a thousand Massachusetts loyalists boarded Bo British ships when Boston was abandoned in 1776, and 15,000 more sailed out of New York Harbor when the war ended in 1781. Altogether, as many as 100,000 women, men, and children left their American homes to take up new lives in England, Canada, and the West Indies. Wealth often determined a loyalist's destination. Rich and influential men, such as Jonathan Sewall of Massachusetts, took refuge in England during the war. But life in England was so expensive that it quickly ate up their resources and drove them into debt. Accustomed to comfort, many of these exiles passed their days in seedy boarding houses in the small cities outside London. They lost more than servants and fine clothes, however. In a society dominated by aristocrats and loyalty, Loyalist men who had enjoyed status and prestige in America suddenly found themselves socially insignificant, with no work and little money. Loyalists in England grew more desperately homesick each day. When the war ended, most of the Loyalists in New England departed for Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, or the Caribbean. Many of these exiles were um, specifically forbidden to return to the United States by the new state governments. Others refused to go back to America because they equated the new Republican society with mob rule. Those who were willing to adjust to the new American nation returned slowly. Less prosperous loyalists, especially those who served in the loyalist battalions during the war, went to Canada after 1781. Many of these exiles suffered depression and despair as they faced separation from family and friends and the bleak climate of Canada. One woman who had bravely endured the war and its deprivations broke down and cried when she landed in Nova Scotia. Like the revolutionaries, these men and women had chosen their political loyalty based on a mixture of principle and self-interest. But unlike the revolutionaries, they had chosen the losing side. They lived with the consequences for the rest of their lives. Canada became the refuge of another group of loyalists, members of the Indian tribes that had supported the crown. The British ceded or gave up much of the Iroquois land to the United States in the Treaty of Paris, and American hostility toward enemy savages made peaceful post-war coexistence unlikely. Thus, in the 1780s, Mohawks, Onondagas, Tuscaroras, Senecas, Oneidas, and Cayugas, Iroquois nations, along with the Delawares, Tutelas, and Nanticokes created new and often multi-ethnic settlements on the banks of the Grand River in Ontario. These communities marked an end to the dislocation and suffering many of these refugees had experienced during the revolution, when steady warfare depleted Indian resources and made thousands dependent on the British for food, clothing, and military supplies. Individual Voices, Esther de Burt Reed, Glories and the Usefulness of Women. Esther de Burt Reed knew that many Philadelphians might consider her fundraising drive for the Continental Soldiers a scandalous undertaking. Proper women were not supposed to go door to door talking to strangers and asking them to contribute to a political cause. To defend this fund drive, Reed and Benjamin Franklin's daughter, Sarah Franklin Bach, issued a broadside entitled Sentiments of an American Woman, in which she reminded her readers that throughout history, women had risen up to support a just cause. She cited Deborah and Esther from the Old Testament, Queen Elizabeth I, and Joan of Arc as examples of patriotic women of the past. Could American women do less for the great cause of independence? We too, she declared, were born for liberty. The following excerpt is from her defense of women's activism in the cause of liberty. On the commencement of actual war, the women of America manifested a firm resolution to contribute as much as could depend on them to the deliverance of their country. Animated by the purest patriotism, they aspire to run themselves really useful. Our ambition is kindled by the same of these heroines of antiquity, who have rendered their sex illustrious and have proved to the universe that if the weakness of our constitution, if opinion and manners did not forbid us to march to glory by the same paths as men, we should at least equal and sometimes surpass them in our love for the public good. Who knows if persons disposed to censure and sometimes too severely with regard to us may not disapprove our appearing and acquainted even with the actions of which our sex boasts? We are at least certain that he cannot be a good citizen who will not applaud our efforts for the relief of the armies which defend our lives, our possessions, and our liberty. Summary. 
1776, few patriots or loyalists believed that America could win its independence from Britain. The British outnumbered and outgunned the Americans, and their troops were better trained and better equipped. The Americans' major advantage was logistical. They were fighting a war on familiar terrain. They've got home field advantage. The early British strategy was to invade New York and the Southern colonies, where they expected to rally strong loyalist support. But this strategy failed, not only because they were waging war on unfamiliar ground, but also because they had overestimated loyalist strength and alienated would-be sympathizers. Washington's hit-and-run tactics made it impossible for the British to deliver a crushing blow. The turning point in the war came in 1777, when British General John Burgoyne's plan to isolate New England from the other rebel colonies failed. Burgoyne was forced to surrender at Saratoga, New York. The surprising American victory at Saratoga led to an alliance between France and the United States, and the expansion of the war into an international conflict. The British invaded the South again in 1778, but desperate early victories, their campaign, but despite early victories, their campaign ended in disaster when French and American forces defeated General Cornwallis at Yorktown, Virginia in October of 1781. Fighting continued for a time, but in March of 1782, the British Parliament ended the conflict. The Treaty of Paris was negotiated in 1783, and to the surprise of many European diplomats, the Americans gained important concessions. Victory led to significant transformations in American society. Individual rights were strengthened for free white men, and a Republican spirit changed the outlook, if not the condition, of many Americans, as customs of deference gave way to more egalitarian, or considering everybody to be equal, behavior. The wartime experiences of women led American intellectuals to, rec to reconsider women's nature and their abilities. Although no state granted full citizenship, white women's capacity for rational thought was acknowledged, and their new role as the educators of their children led to expanded formal education for women. Black Americans also made some gains. 50,000 slaves won their freedom during the war by fleeing to the British or by serving in the Continental Army. Northern states moved to outlaw slavery, but Southern slaveholders decided to preserve the institution despite intense debate. For most loyalists, black or white, the end of the war meant permanent exile from their homeland. Independence had been won, but could it be preserved? In chapter seven, you will read about the struggles of both the federal and the state governments to protect the young nation and to preserve the liberties its citizens had fought to ensure.